So, uh, I am used to be a language implementer and somewhat designer a long time ago in the Lisp family of languages. And mostly what I've been doing since is remoting systems, and that's CORBA, RMI, SOAP, REST, all that kind of stuff, and some low-level stuff like InfiniBand Transport. Uh, but I still, kind of like uh, Levi said, I still look kind of a programming language hobbyist. As a matter of fact, if I could get a job in Haskell, I'd take it. Uh, an interesting thing I actually interviewed, because I, I changed jobs inside of Oracle recently, and I thought, well, as long as I'm changing, I might as well go interview. So I went to San Francisco and interviewed with this company, and passed the first technical interview, and they said, okay, come back in two weeks. Uh, and we're going to do five more of those, you know, what do you call them? Interviews, yeah, right, it's more like torture sessions. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I was studying hard to go back, and then I said, no, I got this new job at Oracle, I think I'll wait. So I sent them an email saying that I was, think maybe I'll come back in six months if they're still interested. But my email bounced. Turns out they went out of business. <laughs> so I guess it's lucky I didn't take that job. So Haskell jobs, they're out there, but they're, uh, they're on the edge. <laughs> So this talk is about pro what I call programming in math. And uh, what that means is just what you, how does math relate? Because I'm sure if you've done functional programming, you've heard like uh, category theory. You keep running into that. And it seems kind of magic. And this, this talk is, to, is not about exactly category theory, because I'm not going to explain what a category is or any of those kind of things. But I'm going to kind of show you what's underneath that all, but a more, a little bit more practical way, because the whole idea with category theory is it's just a bunch of patterns that mathematicians have come up with for mathematics that apply across a million branches. Just about all branches of math, there's categories a theory that works for it, and you can actually take proofs from one and apply it to another one if they have the same structure. So. In functional programming, it turns out you can use a lot of these patterns. So it's just another, they're design patterns. And we've all read the Gang of Four books, so this is just design patterns for functional programming. That's really all it is. It's, I think it's a lot deeper than design patterns, the Gang of Four stuff, because it actually has proofs behind it uh, and a lot more time. Uh, th these things have been around a long time, but they weren't actually uh, codified until about 1945 by McLean and Saunders. Uh, and since then, it's, it's pretty much become the foundation for mathematics, although there's still some controversy there. So credits. Uh, I, nothing in this talk did I do except for the Haskell portion. The rest is directly out of a paper by uh, this Oliveira. He's uh, in, it's a great paper called Program Designed by uh, Calculation, and I'll have a link to that paper later, the full paper, but that's his uh, site, which has a million other great papers, too. Uh, and I found that to be the most accessible introduction to this sort of thing, although today we're only going to go to about page 30-something of his paper, and it has 230, so you got more work to do, in case you wanted to. So, okay, well, here, here we go. So with the function definition, we're all used to math function definitions. And the top one shows you a Fibonacci uh, defined in mathematical notation. And the bottom one, Haskell, looks very similar, except for it has the conditions as part of the argument. So it says uh, f of 0 is 1, or f of anything other number than 0 is n minus 1 times n. So it's almost identical to that thing. So that's, you know, where they have a lot in common. And notice there's no magic there. There's no reading a file, generating a random number, anything like that. It's just always, a, the whole idea of a function is when you give it a, a, an input, it's going to give you back the exact same output every single time. There's no magic going on. So for application in math, you say f of open paren, 5 close paren. And in Haskell, you just say f of 5. Haskell de de determined that function application was the most important thing you do in functional programming. So they decided to make it the, also the least syntax. So you give it the name of the function, 
you give it the arguments. There's no commas, there's no parentheses, there's no nothing. And that turns out to make it uh, pretty nice notation. So an example of that. So th there it is again, and if I start up, uh, oh, sorry, I started again. Oh, it's already there. And so this is uh, GHC, which is the glorious Haskell or compiler, also known as the Glasgow, meaning Glasgow Scotland compiler, or interpreter in this case. So you just say to load that file. And then I call it, you know, f of 0 is 1, and f of 5 is 120, like we know. So nothing, no, no magic there. So, so that's the very basics of uh, functional programming. You, you define functions, you call functions. The next thing is function composition. And what this says is you have a function of type A, that returns a, fun uh, a, uh, a function that takes an input of type A and returns something of type B, and then you have a function f of type that takes an input of type B and returns something of type C. And the notation when you hook those two together is f composed with B, or f after G is another way to say that, meaning it's a function from A to C. And just take a little bit of that. Some people, and me included, the f after G because we're used to reading things left to right so we think of F coming first in G but it's really not and this notation comes because when you do the fully parenthesized one in math you have you call G of X and then you call F of X and if you get rid of all of the parentheses you just have F circle G or F composed G. In Haskell that looks like here's a definition for Haskell uh, this dot they're using dot, and you can actually use Unicode, so you could actually have a circle, but I'm just showing dot here. Uh, and there's parentheses around it for obscure syntactic reasons, which we won't go into. But uh, they're really not that obscure, but uh, why did that shrink? Okay, so here's a function, like on the, on the uh, here's, here's this, so I got A, with, uh, let me see. First I have an F, which is the first argument, it takes arguments from B to C, and you say that by this. It's a function from B to C, and then the second, you know, that's the cool thing, is that's it's just popped up, is uh, Little Snitch. Does any run, anybody else run Little Snitch? It's, it watches all your connections. Anybody tries to connect out or in on your machine, it, that tells you. And you can set up rules, so it, you can say to ignore them or turn it off, which I probably should do, but anyway. Uh, so here's the first function uh, from B to C. The second one is from A to B, and then you give this function an A, and it returns a C. And what that looks like, here's the actual definition. So that's the type signature, and here is the actual definition. I give the F and the G, and as a return, a function that's given an X will return F of G of X. So that looks pretty straightforward. So let's take a look at that in Haskell. Uh, so here's where I'm composing two functions. It's saying that I'm given both, uh, I'm given an A and I'm going to return an A. An A just is, a, it's like in generics in uh, Java in a sense, that you're saying it can be any type of A. And in Java, you usually give capital letters to your types. In, in uh, Haskell, you are required to give... Right. What? Oh, yes. Yes, move this. That work? Okay. Uh, so in Haskell, you have lower, you're required to have lowercase type variables. Uh, so what this says is I'm defined a C, which is a function which first you times whatever number you give it by 99 and then you add 10 to it. So it's pretty straightforward. So if I say C of 1, it's about what we would expect, or C of minus 10 and minus 980. So all that says is first run one function, and then take its results and give it to the next function. So that's composition.
Now I want to say something about, I, I mentioned earlier that there was no magic in functions, so let's take a look at that. And uh, that's why it, this doesn't always work as well in Java or even in uh, Scala because Scala has uh, too many uh, back doors. And in Java, you know, you could say, okay, I want to, here's something where I've got, you know, I call it call G of one and then I give its result to F of whatever G returns. And well, yeah, it kind of looks like functional, but if you actually look at the definitions, what is it doing behind your back? And you can't tell this because you can see that it just takes an int and returns an int. But behind your back, it's creating a reader and reading from a file and using some stuff behind your scenes. And then when you call F, it's doing a writer and doing something else. So because of that, if you uh, If I uh, run this thing, it gives me back a different result. So that's not functional programming. And if I do the same thing in Pascal, and let's change something. And I'll tell you what this is in a minute. So let's say here's G of int to int, and here's F of int to int. And behind the scenes, it's doing these opening files and everything, just like Java did. But if I try to load that up, It's going to complain and there's a lot of but the main thing is it says it can't match ION with int and the, the, to me this is the best one of the best things about Haskell is that when you do anything that has a real side effect it shows up in the type signature and you can't get rid of it and that's good because if you were working with a big team and the guys in China change something overnight you're going to know that they introduce side effects because your interface changed to suddenly have I.O. in them or something else like that. So if I do the same thing here, if I add I.O. to these and load it again, now it loads up. And if I call it, and, and I can't call it the normal composition way with the dot operator, the composition operator, because it's using I.O., which is a monad which we're not going to talk about. I talked about that a year ago, uh, but not tonight. But anyway, you can actually use it by saying something like this. And now if I call it, it still gets a different result every time. But I know that was going to be the fact because, well, I knew that could be a fact because the type of this thing says ION. So I know there's magic going on. Anyway, the whole point of this was one to kind of give you a feel for why what one cool thing about Java you just don't about Haskell that you don't see in in any of the language including Scala and that is when you do side effects real mutatable side effects it shows up in the type signature and to me that's really invaluable and the other piece was is you can't do composition with unless it really is pure okay so moving on Composition is associative, and that's pretty simple. And that is, if you think about this, we're talking about, this is basically just algebra, and we all know that, you know, A plus B, doing that first and then adding C is the same thing as uh, doing B and C first and then adding A to the result. And it's the same deal with composition. And this diagram kind of shows it. So if, let's take the, the left-hand side first. Th this says, well, let's take the, the le left-hand side, yeah. Let's run H first. So we start with A and we run H. So it takes us to a B. And then we run F of G. Uh, G, F follow, G followed by F. Anyway, F follows G. <laughs> uh, so that means first run G, it takes us to a C and then F, and we end up at D. But let's do it this other way. So instead, we run H first, which is really the same thing, and it comes around. Uh, if we run G of H, we end up at C and then F. Or if we run F of G, which is this guy, we end up there. So this diagram just kind of shows you you end up in the same place no matter what. Okay, moving on. And this is going to start pretty slow. It gets a little more complicated. But, uh, but this, is, this is important, you know, like it's kind of establishing 
these aren't axioms, but they're very fundamental finest things and they're generally pretty simple although as you well know from the from the set that contain all sets uh, that simple things can sometimes be a little more troubling than they, they they'd otherwise seem so identity functions are they're saying give me any type a I'm going to return that type and because you don't know anything about the type in advance there's no way you could do anything but give back exactly what you were given because you don't know in advance and this just says given an X return that the cool thing about identity functions they're kind of a limit point of functions they don't lose any information they give you back exactly what you uh, give it and they also are the unit of composition like when in in uh, addition zero is the unit so if you add zero on the on the right or zero on the left that's the same thing as n and id is the same thing for composition if you put id on the left of a, a right of a function or on the left it's the same thing as just applying the function and this diagram kind of shows that now when i was first saw identity functions i kind of thought well so <laughs> what's the big deal uh, well it isn't a big deal but it turns out they actually have uses and this is a, de a demonstration of that uh, what they're useful for is if you have a lot of existing functions and they're supposed to uh, operate on lots of different data structures and you use them in a situation uh, where you really need to kind of either ignore or just don't don't do anything or or, or or just use what you're given and don't transform it. Id identity is pretty cool. And here's an example of that. So I'm defining this function flatten, and the way I'm defining it is using foldr, and the definition of foldr would look something like this. And all foldr is, is when you, I think you've all seen uh, writing explicit, uh, like the length function. How many, how many people have defined the length function uh, using recursion? in Scala or any language. So right, you just, it's one plus the tail, right, until you get to the t nil, and then you return n, whatever that n is. Trouble, and once you've done lots of functional programming, generally you don't write explicit recurs recursion anymore, which is kind of weird because whenever you go to a functional programming book, the first 10 chapters are all about doing that. And then right at the end they say, oh, and by the way, don't do this, use fold. Uh, <laughs> So it's kind of hard to remember to do that. I, I think people should just teach the fold R right near the beginning. Anyway, it's, it's editorial over. Uh, so fold R is just, and fold left, fold left, fold right, which I won't explain the difference, uh, are just that pattern of recursion. It, and then you can use it for different things. So for, uh, let me make sure I'm looking at the right <coughs> thing here. Uh, yeah, okay, this is ID. So flatten is just says, I'm going to define flatten, and it says given a list of lists, just flatten it out and just return a flat list, Put, uh, concatenate, the, concatenate all those lists together. So I do that by calling foldr with plus. And while that is just like doing the length, it says take the first element and concatenate it with the tail, the f fold of the tail, and then keep doing that until you've, so you've just spread out all those things. So it looks like that for this argument, of one, two, and three, list of one, two, and three, it's gonna spread those out so you have one concatenated with two, concatenated with three. And that's done using flatten, uh, fold R. No big deal. And then flat map, you can define by using fold R. Uh, why did I do this? I'm a little, I don't remember why I did that. Oh, I think I did, that, that was too, to make flat uh, fold are a little more uh, easy to understand, and flat map is a similar thing. You're given a function of a and it returns a list of b, and then you give it a list of a and it returns a list of b. So even though you're going to do that operation and get back a whole bunch of list of b, you want to flatten that out. So you can define that using a fold r, and then you can apply it right here, which is just going to do. Uh, one would be x times two and then put it in a list so it's going to return two and four and six and then it's going to concatenate those all together so you could do that by doing this foldr but if you already have 
uh, oh, okay, now I, that's what I fit. So I'm back to flatten again. So if I already have flat map in my arsenal of things, I can now just say flat map ID and suddenly I get uh, flattened for free. And the way that works is, uh, okay, let me. Nope. Okay, so flat map of, let me try something else because I want to make sure. Oh, I see. There's tons of more. My screen's showing more than what's up there. Okay. And this is where I need a smaller font. Do you somehow manage to go uh, to your left again? <sighs> Is that readable? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It just keeps doing that, doesn't it? No matter what I do. Okay. So flat map of of these lists is just then you replace it with its uh, definition, with and that's the definition that uses ID. So flat map of ID. Then it just says, okay, it takes the first thing and applies it, which is this function given one, and then this fold R given the rest of the list. And when you give an ID of one, uh, when you then uh, give this one and uh, bind it to X, then it turns into ID of one, and then that turns into just one because ID just gives back what you want to. And once you have that, then you do the next step. And that's fold R of, of the rest, and that turns into ID of two, and f the, the, then the recursive call on fold R. And so it just keeps going through until you end up with what we showed earlier, and that was one plus two plus three. I should turn on line numbers. Yeah, okay. Anyway, the, po the point of that was to show you that ID is actually a useful function because uh, you can use it in situations uh, where you really what might have transformed something in the past, but you don't want to because you actually want to use the exact same object, but you're still getting other functionality by some of the library functions you're using. Okay, and back to here. Okay, now the other end is constant functions. Constants functions are given any argument, they're going to return something else. So they basically lose all information. So identity function were one limit. They're, they, they keep every bit of information you give it. A constant function is just the opposite, the limit case, in that it's going to lose everything. So here's something that shows in Haskell there's this function const, and given an A, and then given a B, it's always going to return an A. And you can partially apply functions in Haskell, which means you don't have to give it all of its arguments. And, and if you don't, matter of fact, well, I won't, don't say it. <laughs> uh, if, if you just give partial arguments, then what you get back is still another function that says, give me the rest of the arguments. So it's occurring, in other words. Uh, so if you define this C, given an A, return a character, and C is defined as constant C. So if you apply that to anything, any A, it's always going to return this uh, C. So what that looks like is, oops, not that. Why? Oh yeah, now I, okay. So uh, uh, this is the same deal as, as ID. What's the big, you know, I, when I first saw constant functions, I felt the same way. Yeah, so what? What the heck would I ever use that for? Because if I know that I'm going to ignore the arguments, why don't I just ignore them? Well, that's if you're writing all your code. 
uh, or even if you're, if you, uh, uh, even if you, but if you're using library functions or even library functions that you've written that you are not going to change, but you know they're going to can do most of what you need, you can use constant functions to help you out. And this is where length is defined. So here's the definition of length with explicit recursion, which we talked about earlier, which just says given a, an empty list returns one as the length. Otherwise, it's an x cons onto x's. In other words, that's the notation in Haskell for saying here's the head of the list, uh, and the, the colon is the cons, and then here's the rest of the list. So this says that's one plus then the recursive call, the length of the tail of the list. And if you do explicit, uh, if you use full tail instead, you can. Uh, Define and I, fold L is similar to fold right, except for it, it folds from the left instead of the right. And there's some other magic. And oh, and here's something you should know. One of the interview questions that I had uh, a couple months ago for that job that disappeared <laughs> uh, was which one of fold left and fold right can handle infinite lists and why? It was a great question because it was a great question. But we won't answer that today, but that'll be uh, on the test for <laughs> somebody, actually somebody respond on our, on our, uh, to tonight's uh, meeting invite when you get the answer and show why, because it's, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so length, here it is. I'm saying that length can be done with a fold and using the constant function composed with the successor function. So let's see how that works. If you're given length of A and B, then that turns into uh, con uh, fold left of cons composed with the successor of zero. And then if you do the first step of that, it says that it is fold L of that, that's always going to look this way because that just, all the recursive calls just keep passing this function. And the function is that composition, cons uh, successor followed by cons. So then, it takes the first A and gives it to that function. So you have zero and A. And what it does is it says, apply the successor, which only takes one argument, to this argument. So that turns it into one. And then it says, do const of one and A. So what that says is take the second argument A and ignore it and just return whatever you gave it. So there's the one. And then it just does the same thing again for the next element in the list, and it goes through it, and it turns it into two, and that's it. So it's things like that where these ID and constant functions turn out to be useful. If you just stick them there in a line of code where you, it's kind of, just, they're not useful, and that was actually my first reaction, but it turns out that uh, it's really in library code where they become interesting. Okay, I already said this, that there are limit points, and uh, IDs preserve all, cons lose all, and uh, the whole idea of functional programming is you're transforming, uh, or you're, where you're losing or adding information uh, in a context. Okay, and now we're going to isomorphisms. And I think everybody knows what an isomorphism is, and what that just says is, if they're if given an F of A to B, there's an inverse of F from B to A, and if you compose those two, either such that you first run the inverse and then the F, or you run the F first and then the inverse, they will always return what you gave them. So first it'll transform it into a B, like if you run F first. First it'll transform it to B, and then it'll transform it back to an A. And what that says is, what that really means is you can convert between formats and without losing anything. And I always joke that really that's 90% of our jobs as computer programmers. There's like a teeny little bit of actual calculation going on, but most of the time we're taking stuff off the wire. You know, the TCP stack, you know, transforms all that stuff and it gives us, and then we take it through REST interface, all this stuff, and turn it into other things. And then we have to talk to some subsystem that uses some weird data format, so we have to transform it to that. It does whatever it does, and finally we get some numbers back. But most of the time we're just, transforming data, in, formatting data in different ways to get it between subsystems. And we do a little bit of computation. Does anybody compute, actually? I, I mostly transform data. 
Uh, okay, and I had a I had a file here. Is isomorphisms. So this one kind of interesting, showing you isomorphisms, isomorphisms in Java in one way. So I've defined uh, weekday and seven. So weekday is just Sunday through Saturday, or Monday through Sunday, I guess you could say, and then one through seven. And it, it says that it's deriving enum, eq, ord, and show. And that's a way, in, so this is a way you de define a data structure, what's called an algebraic data structure in Haskell. And uh, so that's, it's, it's named weekday, it has these elements, and you could also even put arguments in here if you had some, but we're not doing that. Uh, and it's also saying that automatically provide enum support, equality support, ordering support, and printing support for this, uh, for these, this uh, type. So same thing with seven. Now I'm defining a transform function, and this says, Given an A, return a B. In other words, I'm going to change it to something. But it also says, but the A has to be an enum and it has to be an ord. And the B has to be an enum and it has to be an ord. In other words, it has to have those qualities or that it won't work. And that's, that's called type classes. Uh, so the transform, all it does is a composition. It says, first, turn this thing uh, from an enum. Given an enum, turn it into an integer. Uh, and then it composes it to enum. So it says, given an integer, turn it back into an enum. So if I say, like here, uh, transform Tuesday, let's actually try that. Okay, I zero. So it returns three. So Tuesday is the third day of the week if, you're, if you start from Sunday. Now notice I'm doing the same thing here. I'm transforming Tuesday, but now I'm saying it's a weekday. So if I say I zero prime, it turns it back into Tuesday. And that's because the transform uh, function here actually doesn't know anything. It just says, I know the types have to do these qualities, but I don't know. It could be any sort of enum. Uh, and so it's these functions that is actually locking that down and saying, I'm, that, you know, it, you're given in a specific type here, Tuesday, so it knows the type just because it's, it's a, a, a object of that type, uh, a piece of data of that type. But you're saying here it's going to be r back as a seven or here as a weekday. So even though you're calling this thing with the exact same uh, argument, the return type said it was different, and that's what happens. What will Haskell do? Uh, it will, let's do it. Complaint. And the complaint is uh, that there's no instance of uh, org for that thing. So it doesn't know what to do. Most of the time, Haskell, you don't need to put uh, type signatures on functions. Uh, it's now considered good practice to put them on because they're good documentation. Uh, but that, that was one of Haskell's selling points to a lot of people that like dynamic languages like Python and such is that you know you don't have to do all that typing and typing both this kind of typing and typing well actually in Haskell for 90 plus percentage of things you don't have to actually add type annotations because it'll infer them in this case it couldn't do it though well it's, it's good practice to do it on like top level definitions but the, it, it is really nice to have type inference for when you get nested uh, functions you do like inside of where's and stuff like that. And so yeah. That, that's another thing to consider. Right, yeah. You know, you can, you can uh, as what, what he was saying was that you can define local functions inside of other functions. And generally people don't put type signatures there. I do occasionally when it's comp complicated to me and even while I'm writing I realize I, I will never understand this later and so I'll add it for me, not for, because the, the compiler knows. Yeah, well I agree, it's still good documentation. Right. Okay, so, I, okay, there we go. Okay, now we're going to products. And this is, gets into the, this is the beginning of stuff where you'll hear people in the functional programming com community say products, co-products, monads, co-monads, catamorphisms, and you go, oh God, what's that? And 
you, it's a bunch of fancy names for stuff we use all the time. And, and I say fancy, it's really the mathematicians had this stuff first. And that's what they named it. So we call it that because that's what they named it and they got there first. Uh, so anyway, products are real simple. Uh, all it says is it, it's a way to compose functions that won't compose. And there's several different way, the ways that can come about. And in this case, you're given an F and a G and notice the function, uh, the type of the function. F is something from a C to an A and G is a C to a B. In other words, they both have the same domain, but they have different ranges. So what they're saying is, for this pair, is given these two functions and then given a C, which is their input, return a pair. <laughs> so return both of their values. And that's it, that's what a product is. And you can kind of think of it as, this notation, which is uh, Oliveira in his paper uses this bracket notation saying f of g is the same thing as this pair definition. So given a c, it returns an a times a b. So it's the cross product. So, uh, and it, it's pretty simple. Uh, and the actual definition in his notation is f of c and g of c, which actually looks pretty much identical in uh, Haskell. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so uh, here's that definition again, and here's a product. And one thing I wanted to say is I've d explicitly defined this product just to make it so it's, it's, so we can understand it. But you don't have to do this because there's a package in Haskell called control.arrow, which abstracts a lot of these type of things. And so this line 10 and 11 shows you the definition using you know my home built one. But if you actually use the uh, arrows, you use this notation, and it's, it, but it's the same thing. So here's what we just looked at on the previous slide, and now I'm actually using it to say I've defined these two functions that take a uh, pair of an integer to a string and return a string to an integer. So what it does is the, the first argument first times whatever the integer is by two, and then it turns it into a string. Show is the function that turns something into a string. Uh, and the second one says concatenate, add, uh, append one to whatever string you give it, and then turn it into an integer. So if I actually look at that then and say PR0 prime, you see it's four and 61, and PR01 is gonna do the same thing. It's just using the arrow notation. Uh, is so is that syntax where you're defining types and you've just got the common limited list? Is that just saying all of these have this type? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. This right here. Yeah. 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 I. That. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Products. So that is a product. Okay. Now co-products are also a way to compose uncomposable functions. And in this case, what this is saying is that you're given the A or B, and you're gonna return a C. So it's just the opposite as the previous case. Remember the previous case, you started with a C. In other words, they both took the same input, but they uh, uh, did different output. In this case, uh, they both take different inputs types, but they return the same output. So the way that's done is you're given uh, this X, and if the X is labeled with left, and this is like a tagged union uh, in C or something. So if you have a left, if it's tagged like this is a left value of A or a right of B, if it's a left, then I'm going to say uh, f of a, and otherwise I'm going to do g, g of b. So these are both going to return the c. Uh, and when you get back what you get back, you don't know. By the time you get the c, you don't know where it came from. You just know that the, the, it picked the right one and moved on from there. And that kind of looks like this in, in, in a picture. 
and that you have the A and the B. So you have an A, and if you have one, you tag it with the left. Otherwise, you have a B, and you tag it with the right. And then you give this uh, either function this value, and it will produce C. It will either use F or G, depending on it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's the definition of either, and that is given an A to C and given a B to C. So you can see very clearly there that they both have the same output but different inputs. Then you're given an either A or a B, and it returns a C. And the way that looks in Haskell is you say, okay, if the input is tagged with left, in other words, left of A, then I'm going to take F, and this underscore means I can ignore it because I'm not going to use it. And so I'm going to return F of A. And likewise, if it's tagged with right, then I'm going to grab G, ignore F, or whatever you want to call it, and give you back a, a G. So, and if you look at the, the various values here, E of 0 is 99, E1 is 2. And just like I said a minute ago, I've gone and defined this either, but either is already defined in Haskell, and control.arrow also already has this too. So the, the notation is that arrow notation, A-R-R, -R, and these uh, three vertical lines, which because either is also kind of like or, it's either a left or it's a right, so with the three vertical bars, you basically know that it's, it's an or. So that's coproducts. So coproducts uh, sounded mysterious at one time, but it turns out they're pretty straightforward. And they're the dual. Yeah, a question? So I look at that and I'm like, okay, so where do you use that practically? Because it, it looks like a workaround to get, like, I don't know, something like polymorphism uh, object oriented programming. That can't be it. Well, I could see it like it, it, in functional reactive programming where you wire a lot of pieces together and you can actually have things that are like joins and uh, but the joins you might need to do something different and they might cut well actually you, you have no choice because they're different types and so if they're labeled left to right then you can have the rest of your system just go on from that join uh, based on using one of these. Yeah, I guess you could look at it that way, yeah. <laughs> Can I, like, I mean, similar things, I, I don't have really any Haskell experience, but similar type things, it, it actually is to get exactly that. It's to get polymorphism, but it's polymorphism a la carte, right? It's not polymorphism coupled to object hierarchies and object and all that stuff. It's just, I'm going to have this call function application and I can put these things in and I'm going to get one of these out, right? And so it's, it's a way that when you need to do that dispatch and you're going to be returning something the same all the time, but different things go in, which is exactly what polymorphism is, right? That, that's it. That's what it's for. So a lot of situations where you do that, right? Inside the implementation of every dynamically typed language, you have a type that is the co-product of all of the uh, data types that your interpreter or the virtual machine knows how to process. So a value in a dynamic programming language is one of any number of types that the, the language knows how to handle. And they're all contained in a co-product type. And the dispatch mechanism that evaluates things in your dynamic language does dispatch based on the tag, the discriminator for the discriminated unit. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. I hadn't thought of it that way. What does Robert Harper call dynamically type unit type languages, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's I mean, it. You, yeah. You, you don't have to uh, use that terminology, but it's, no. it's, it's the way that. You design the interpreter for uh, a, a bytecode, or, or uh, if you're writing just a simple language interpreter, interpret on the level of uh, data types. 
Right. So actually, he just, Levi just answered the question. Where's the application? An interpreter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, moving on. So uh, product cancellation. This one's real easy, but this it starts to introduce these diagrams in a little bit more, and that is if you have uh, a product, and that's remember this is the notation, these uh, angle brackets. So given a C, I have these functions F and G, which both take C's as inputs but return different outputs. So it returns the product or a pair of these things. But now if I want to get at those pairs, you can use first and second. Okay, well that's pretty dumb. <laughs> But, uh, uh, this is, but these things are building blocks, so every little simple step becomes more interesting later. Uh, and there's the same thing with, uh, with co-product cancellation, and that says that if you have some value and you add left to it, and this I1 really means left, I lifted this from his, uh, I, I, I drew a lot of these diagrams myself, but I ran out of time and started scanning his. Uh, but I1 meant, means left and I2 means right. Uh, it says if you have a value A, you label it with left, and then you run it into this co-product, uh, it will return a C. Because remember, this thing will run G if it's left or H if it's right, and then just return a value. So in that case, it's just going to run just G and H. So you can, and this, you really don't, can't use that much when you're writing your code, but a compiler could see this and do something with it. Let's take a look at some cancellation. And this is all it says, is, is if you have an either of two functions, which are plus these two functions, oh, and I, I have showed these a number of times and I didn't explain it. These are partially applied functions here, and that it says this is the function that adds 10 uh, to any other number you give it. And this is just the notation for that, or here's the function that uh, times it by 10. And I had one a while ago that showed appending in the same way. I, I'm sorry I didn't point that out a little bit more. And so it says to run this function composed with putting a left on something. And so what this says is if it's got a left, you know it's going to pick this left one. So it's just going to time to, uh, add 10 to it. So you don't even need to do that. You can just get rid of all of that and just do the 10. So that's all cancellation is. And like I said, a compiler would probably do this. I don't think uh, it would be used in other situations. But when I say a compiler, uh, I've been reading a number of interesting blogs by functional programmers, and they're pointing out that just a lot of the work that we do can be viewed as parsing and compiling. And so when you write parsers and compilers and you run into patterns, you can actually start, you don't know what your input's going to be, but you know as you start building it up and you see these kind of patterns that you can optimize it away. So even though we don't think of ourselves, most of us, as, as language compiler writers, we're always transforming data, and we're always parsing it and then munging it. And you can actually do that. Quite a bit of that is really the same job as a compiler. So these things can start to apply. Okay, so now we're going to uh, the pr uh, product of two functions. And what this says is you can use these to compose functions when neither their domains nor their ranges coincide. So what this says is if I have a pair of C and D and I run it through this F times G, I'm going to get a new pair of F and G. And this is pretty simple because all that says is take the first of this C and D and compose in, and then run F and take the second, then run G and then put them back together again as a pair and give me A and B. So that's, that's all it says. And, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I think I product. Let me see. Yeah, we already did this one. I think I went to the wrong slide, I mean, the wrong example earlier. But here's one thing I, I skipped earlier. Remember when I was talking about these are called sections? And this is one of those. And that is, this is just a function that says, append uh, the string one to anything that's given. 
So it's expecting a string and then it'll do it. So that's a really compact notation for things like this. And then that turns, turns out to be used a lot in Haskell. Okay, and then here is the, uh, the co-product of two functions. And that says, remember when we looked at the, the co-product before, it said that it's either gonna take a left value or a right value and then run F or G and just return the value. Now it's gonna do the same thing except for it's going to re-tag the value so you know where it came from. And so what this says is I have a C, I put a left on it, I have a D, I put a right on it. Uh, whoops, excuse me, this is, I'm starting down here. Uh, so it's already been tagged. Here, I run F or G, so it's either going to run F or G, and then it's going to re-tag it so you know which, which one got ran. That's all, that's all that is. So let's go take a look. So here's that definition, and that says either uh, run f. It's going into either. So because it's going into either, which we defined earlier, you know it's going to be looking for the left or right coming in. And then it's going to either run this function here or that function there, depending. Once it gets the value out, it, it will give it to g or f, but then it re-tags it by then applying right to it. So if you actually look at this, and say uh, S0, it says it's a left, and I say S1, and we'll see uh, it's a left. If we see S2, it's a right. And once again, this has control notation, control arrow notation. In this case, it's the plus, plus, plus. And that again uh, is like uh, addition or either or or. Uh, and that's where it starts to look like uh, a dynamically typed language. Right, because you instead of if you had instead of either int int, you had either int string or either int rule. Then, if it was an int, it would be tagged left. If it was a rule, it would be tagged right. The and is it's opt in in this case. Yeah. Yeah, this one you're you're controlling because it depends on what you're going to do further in your system. And if you need further discrimination, then you would use something like this. So these left and right. What? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Built in in the sense that it's a standard library. library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all good it point. Just, like it takes a type and returns that, it just wraps that type in another. Right. Actual the actual definition, if you go to the either definition in Haskell, then it has the either is the name of the type, and then the two constructors are left and right, which both take a value of A or B. So you say, well, it says right here, like this says that the type is either a C or a D. And then it will either uh, then it'll then the left and the right relate to the C or the D. So if you remember the the idea of algebraic data types, basically if you have the data keyword in Haskell and use it to define a type, that creates a, a sum of products. So if you only use the sum part, then you end up a sum type. If you only use the product. That would probably be an interesting lightning talk in a, f in a future uh, meeting, is to talk about the algebra of algebraic data types. There's some great blogs on it, but uh, it'd, it'd make a nice short talk sometime. Yeah, I, I covered it a bit in one of my yeah. early presentations, but that was a long time ago. You covered it in a ton of other stuff. <laughs> Okay, we okay there. Okay, now this is going to get more interesting now because it's the diagrams are getting more complicated. This is uh, product fusion. What this says is that if you run F and then follow it by the product of G and H, that is the same thing as distributing F inside. So you just run the product of F composed with G and F composed with A. H and you can see that by saying like, okay, let's, let's try this one first. If I just do F first, it gives me back, it starts with a D, gives me back a C. And then I do G and H. And G and H is this guy, 
And remember, all that is is run G and run H and return their pair of results. So there's the A and the B. So that's what that gives back. But if you actually then, no, let's try it this way instead. So let's run D and then F composed with H, which the compose looks like that. It gets you to a B. And then the other side, uh, F composed with G, gets you to A. And of course, because you're running it inside these angle brackets, it's a pair of these things. So it's, you can distribute things. Uh, and there's likewise the similar thing with, uh, did that actually, oh yeah, product fusion, don't want to, don't want to shortchange it. Product fusion. So this one has a really long type signature, uh, and it says, given this function, C to A, C to B, D to C, and then given a D, return an A and a B, which if we went back to that slide, you'd see it. And this is, the, this is the left definition, and this is the right definition. And the idea is we're going to see that they're actually the same thing. So if we say product left, so I'm giving, giving it a uh, times 2, and then I'm giving it a uh, show of digit to int of 3. So if you run these things, and this is why I kind of do this as like a mini equational reasoning. Equational reasoning means you just replace equals with equals like you uh, do in algebra. Uh, so what this says is the definition of product left is to run pair of those same functions. So I do this pair of times two and this show. And now if I do that, uh, the first thing I do is run digit to int on three. So that turns this digit into an int. And then uh, the next thing I'm doing is I'm doing times two of three. No, I'm running pair. So here's the pair. So it turns this into a pair. So there's the outer paren and there's the comma to make it a pair. And then I run the left side, which is times two times three is six. And then I do a show on three, which turns into a string and it turns into that number. Uh, and I've done that by hand. And then if I do the right hand side, I won't step through it, but it says the exact same thing. So if I actually load that up and then say P of F, notice they're all returning the exact same thing. So more interesting than that though, and I think this is the one I'm going to get ahead of myself, uh, some fuse I'm going to skip. Oh, okay, this is, this is the one I wanted to get to. Uh, we showed that uh, in this case, the in, in product fusion, that the, the pair is right distributive with respect to composition. But it's, it is not left distributive. Uh, but it actually will, if it, it, it is, if f is i times j, a pair of two functions. And so what that claim is, is if you have i times j composed with the pair of g and h, it'll actually turn into the pair of i composed with g and g composed with h. And this is where this starts to really show what you can do. And remember, this is still just baby steps, but it really starts to show what you can do with this stuff. And that is, okay, I want to make sure this really works and I don't want to write a unit test to do it. So instead, I'm going to prove it. So what this says is, okay, here's what I have on the left-hand side, a pair of functions composed with, uh, no, excuse me, the product of two functions composed with a pair of two functions. So if you take the definition of product of two functions, that turns this into this side into I composed with first and J composed with second. That's all. And then the next thing you do is use product fusion, which is with the last slide we did about products, which I won't go back and I'm going to pretty much gloss over it because we'll never see all the details. But it just basically expands that some more. And then you do the fact that uh, composition is associative. So I've moved these uh, parentheses over to here. And same thing, I've moved these parentheses over here. And then I use a product cancellation on all this. And you can go back to the slides and do all the steps by hand, and you end up with the right-hand side. And 
that's where the stuff really starts to shine is that you can actually prove your programs correct and in Haskell you can start to do things like this in the type system uh, which we won't go into but it's it, it, to do type level programming so you can express a lot lot tighter constraints on your programs than you can and, you know I know when I first heard of Haskell has a great type system because the only types I'd ever been exposed to was C and Java I'm going like what's the big deal uh, well after I wrote enough Haskell code then I went oh I see well one I showed you earlier you could, it sticks IO if you have side effects that you don't see else and, and, that, and, and but you can also start expressing uh, higher level constraints in your types anyway so th that's that and uh, okay so we der derive that and here's the picture for that which uh, given that I'm already over an hour I'll I won't go into a lot of detail on that and let me take a peek at product absorption in here okay so this is what we just saw and that's all those functions that you pass in and then once you pass those function in you're given a specific type of C and then it's going to return an A or a B and if you read this, read this code right now, it would be a little inscrutable. Uh, but if you had the diagram to go with it, it would certainly help, which I, I could switch back to it. And then this is the, so this is the right-hand side, and this is the left-hand side. And remember, the right-hand side just said that the product of I and, G, I and J composed with the pair of G and H is the same thing as the pair of I composed with G and G composed with H which is exactly what we went through. So here's an example where I just say, okay, the function is show, read, times two, and show, and I give it a four. So zero, it returns eight and four, and if I try the right, eight and four. So that's my, that's my unit test. The, uh, Proof was really my unit test, and it was more than a unit test because it says for every every value I give it, it's going to be right. But this also lets you play with it a little bit. Uh, where should I go, Ben? The guy, should I go longer or what? Um, probably a couple more minutes, maybe. Okay. Okay. So. These, uh, one thing that it said in the abstract, which was actually not true, and that's because uh, I had got to a certain point in the paper back when I first wrote that abstract and found out that where I, I was going to get into uh, uh, functors, but I found out that I needed a lot more groundwork in place according to that uh, paper that I've been following. Uh, so I'm actually not going to show functors. But this kind of lays some groundwork. And what this says is the uh, product functor. So it says that if you're given a G composed with H composed with an I composed with G, it is the same thing as the pr uh, product of these two functions composed with the product of the other one. In other words, the, uh, the uh, product is, is, uh, it can distribute with respect to composition. And the other thing is, is this thing, uh, uh, product functor ID which says if you give two identity functions it's the same thing as just giving the identity of A and B and what that looks like if you give product to A, ID and ID remember all product did was said take whatever this is take the first thing out of it give it to that function take whatever this is take the second thing out of it which is Y give it to that function and then package them back up to a pair so you end up back with your with what you started. So that's the same thing as ID. That's all that says. And, and I had to draw my own diagram and I never got around to, uh, can you actually read that? Yeah, if you can. Uh, I draw it on a crummy piece of paper so you can see the smudges over everywhere. Because uh, he didn't have this diagram and I, I decided I needed it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the same deal as if you follow all these things. Uh, so if you're given an A and a B, 
and then you give it a G and an H, which is this, and the I uh, compose with J, you end up with C and D. And th you can just follow all these pieces to get there. So these diagrams, I'm not going to walk through this, but the idea of these diagrams, they really help when you start building these kind of networks of transformations. And you try to understand, this shows you all the paths they can or that go through. Or actually, they don't, you know, this is the actual notational path. But behind the scenes, what's really going on is a lot of this other stuff. And they really, they really help me to understand what's going on. Yes? So you've been illustrating these concepts in Haskell. But how much, what, what are your base assumptions for this to actually play out in Haskell? Because it sounded a little bit back there, like on the last slide or whatever, you said I needed a lot more groundwork than that. Well, I just need to like write my own library. For oh, no, no, no. Uh, what I meant by that was my, my uh, abstract said I was going to talk about functors. But to get to functors, I would need to lay out more stuff uh, in the slides to even be able to show that. And that's all I meant. As far as actually in Haskell, the, the libraries I already have this and mo lots, 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 lots more. So th this is everything that I've shown is already available in Haskell. Yeah. And a lot of it is used in Haskell and you, don't, and you won't use it. Like there's a great library, probably one of the, the, the ones that you use, the probably the library that uses category theory more than anything else is this one called Lens by a guy named Edward Komet, who's this force of nature uh, guy in Haskell. And he, if, if you look at that code, it's, it's amazing because he does co-monads this and, and uh, all sorts of stuff. And he, and, and I want you know just go take a look at Lens because it's a it's a really deep, but a lot of people are worried that if he gets hit by a, a train or something, uh, no one will be able to maintain that package. <laughs> yeah, some of the fun things in Lens you find that some crazy operator turns out to just be defined as the identity function. Yeah, and and it works because of the type structure. The the. The type specializes identity to uh, collapse the definition into what you happen to need at that point. Right. Yeah. That that's a. I, I have that. You know, I, I look at it and try to understand it, and it's just that's an amazing piece of code. But that's probably the one the most advanced use of all this type of stuff out there. But there's a lot of that stuff used in the libraries, and there's a lot of the building blocks available as as libraries too. So th there's some other interesting applications to the, the, these ideas. Uh, if you think back to what you do with algebra, it, you know, sometimes you use it to simplify things so it, it's easier to understand. Sometimes you use it to move things into a form that's easier to do something else with. And the, the point of this is that when you write your programs this way, you can manipulate your programs that way and you can be sure that they mean the same thing after you do the manipulation. And sometimes you do this for the purposes of optimization. And because it's backed by mathematical proofs, you know it's safe to do it. And it can be automated as well. And there's there was some recent research where they took advantage of fusion laws to do a highly optimized linear algebra state-of-the-art C++ libraries. So there are real practical applications to this. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that just really, that was a great thing to say, and that is, you know, we all refactor code all the time. And I don't mean rename variables, but actually we see a common pattern and we take it out and call it a separate method or something. We do that all the time. And as you, if you start functional programming you, and you know some of these patterns in, that are in math and in functional programming, and you'll start recognizing in your own code that you write and say, wait a minute, that's, uh, I can use control arrow either right there or, or something, and, and then you can drop that in and suddenly your code shrinks to nothing. And uh, you don't have to maintain that anymore because you're using a library function. So these, these patterns are useful. And, and like I said, at this level I've been showing so far, they're pretty simple. The, this functors, there's definitely more uh, arrows in there. But it's still pretty simple. 
but it's, 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 it's useful stuff for refactoring. It's useful stuff if you're writing code. And like I said earlier, where you're writing compilers, and, and I'm trying to learn to do that myself because I've really been reading about free interpreters using free monads, which, uh, which to just do data transformations. It has nothing to do with writing a compiler, but just do data transformations. And, but you end up having the opportunity to apply these in your parser to the data that's coming in once you recognize it. And I think I'll leave it at that because these will just kind of go on. It, go, it, it goes on and on forever. Oh, there's another. Oh, this one's cool. Let's take a look, real quick look because this one's understandable. <laughs> uh, the product of two functions is commutative. In other words, uh, uh, A times B is to say is, can commute to B times A. And you can do that by saying uh, the second times first is, is that you can define swap uh, to be second and first. In other words, if you're given a function, if, if, if you're given a pair and then you run it through this, it'll first run second on it and then first, so it'll swap their values. So the, to prove this is true, if you run swap twice, you should get back where you came from. So the way you do that is you take this swap and you take the definition of it and stick it in there. So the, here's the definition of swap, we've just put it there. That's all we've done. And then we do the uh, product fusion law, which says that you can uh, distribute swap into each of those uh, elements. So I have second composed with swap and first composed with swap. And then I stick in the definition of swap again. So where I had this swap, I now put the second and the first, second and the first, which is the definition. And then I do product cancellation, which says, uh, What does product cancellation say? It says, oh yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's because I'm just gonna take the second, I don't care what the first is. And because I'm taking the first, I don't care what the second is. So in that case, I just put first here and second. And notice, uh, first and second is the same thing as ID. So you get back what you gave it. So that's pretty cool. That, and that one's actually, un, that was the proof that was understandable. And what that means, uh, another way to think of that is if you've got record structures and you're swapping things around, you can do that. You're not losing any information. If you're depending on order, you know, you've got to take that into account. But the main point is you've got all your information still around. And here's another proof that um, it's going to be an exercise, and that's that uh, the product is associative. So what you want to do is prove that uh, the, they're isomorphic. And you can do that. There's the proof, but I'm not going to show it to you because you got to, that's uh. <laughs> Anyway, that, I think that's it. So the, the, the summary is, one, all this stuff depends on purity. Because if your functions are doing magic, I.O., randomness, whatever, behind the back, then this, there's no point in it. It just doesn't work. But as long as, and, but you've got to do I.O. and there's a place for it. You do it, but then, you, you know, 90% of your program should be pure. And then the part that does I.O. should be, you know, put outside at night. And, <laughs> or on m Sunday nights, I think, in our neighborhood. And uh, so purity is critical. And then there was the application and composition and all the various properties. And once you have those, you can do equational reasoning. And that's both yourself as you're looking at the code to make sure it's right, but you can actually start putting that in your code if you're actually writing code. So it, it, it knows the right thing. There's a bunch of patterns. They're just all come from math, specifically from category theory. And there's lots more in the paper. And the very specific lead to that paper is this, this one here. That's the exact paper. And like I said, where we got to, and actually I skipped some of it, so we probably made it to page 25, so we've, we've only made it <laughs> less than a tenth of a way. So we'll meet back here next week to <laughs> go on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. And questions? So uh, there's another interesting paper, and the, the beginning of it is very approachable. It, it, kind of veers off into uh, category theory land, but uh, it's by Eric Meyer, who uh, was involved with uh, C-sharp and 
whatnot at Microsoft Research. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And uh, he wrote this paper along with uh, a couple other guys uh, called Functional Programming with Bananas, Lenses, Envelopes, and Barbed Wire. And those are all references to uh, symbols that look kind of like those things. But it, it makes for a memorable name anyway. But uh, he goes through a lot of the same ideas here, talking about uh, the different laws and how you can use them to transform programs and to do proofs. He says that each of these laws is both a proof principle and a mechanism of program transformation. And even if you are not in the habit of uh, writing proofs about your programs, the the nice thing about the, the fact that these fusion laws are proof principles is that instead of having to set up your uh, standard proof by induction uh, to prove things about recursive functions, you can appeal to one of these uh, fusion laws and it gives you an instant proof instead of having to manually walk through the so just like these uh, operators uh, simplify uh, rec writing recursive programs or programs that operate on recursive data, if they apply exactly the same kind of simplification to the proofs of or reasoning about those same programs. I'm glad you brought, you know, I've known that paper's existence, but I thought it was a lens paper. So that's great. Now I know that I should read it sooner than later. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. You don't need to know any of this to do functional programming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>